Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Losing is living and winning. I counted all my dollars while God counted crosses. I counted gains while He counted losses. I counted my worth by the things gained in store, but He sized me up by the scars that I bore. I coveted honors and sought for degrees. He wept as He counted the hours on my knees. I never knew till one day by a grave how vain are the things that we spend life to save. I did not know till a friend went above that richest is he who is rich in God's love. The author unknown. Timmy. Timmy, a five-year-old boy, was in kindergarten class when his teacher asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, instinctively, Timmy just blurted out and he said, I want to be God. I want to be God. Now, he might have been simply acting smart, but did he not spontaneously speak the mind of all of humanity today? We want to be God, make our own rules, call the shots, and be the top dog, because that's what the world stresses. In a world with such messed up values, how do you teach a child that as often as a Christian they may lose, but in the end, save their life through faith. When we want to get to know someone, we may ask them, what, what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? And what, what do we really mean by living? We, of course, mean their occupation. But is that really living? Is it not a living something profoundly more? Isn't it more than that? more substantial than the way we make our money? Is that really living? So if a person doesn't have a career, they're not living? Christ came to save lives by losing his. Christ has come into a dying, broken world to save it. But our idea of saving lives is usually quite different from what Jesus had in mind from verses 21 and 22 of our gospel lesson for today. The George S. Patton approach makes a lot of sense to us. Nobody ever won a war by dying for his country. You win a war by making the other guy die for his country, was George S. Patton's quote. Saving a whole world full of lives would surely, usually involve, wouldn't it, a great deal of money and powerful armies and important people. And Jesus had something completely different in mind from verse 23 of our Matthew text. The greatest and most holy act of all time, Jesus' sacrificial death, will look to some like a terrible travesty of justice, a dark day. But Jesus' death would turn the world absolutely upside down. I like to read history, and of course I especially like the Revolutionary War period of time. And, you know, when George Washington's ragtag army prevailed at Yorktown, effectively ending the American Revolutionary War, Lord Cornwallis was forced to give up. And as he and his men marched out to surrender to Washington and his Continental Army, the British band played a popular song of that day, the title, The World Turned Upside Down. And no doubt for these soldiers, these polished and experienced soldiers of the British Empire, they believed that they were surrendering to a band of rebels and upstarts. It had to be devastating for them. Jesus turned the world on its head the day he died on the cross also. He looked weak, but he was victorious. He looked like a loser, but he became our savior. For us then as well, losing has become winning, dying has become living, and all the measures the world would apply to us, they don't work anymore. Matthew 16, 25. Christ continues to work his way through us, having saved the world by his death. Jesus now uses his people to be part of his holy work in the losing of their own lives. Today, martyrs are being made in places all over the world, and 
persecution exists all over the world as well. But so too in this place, countless Christians are giving their lives one moment at a time, one act of love at a time, one Sunday school lesson taught, one word of forgiveness at a time, one word of encouragement at a time. Every minute, every day, every hour spent in any such activity is one we have left that we can serve the Lord, not our own selfish and worldly desires. We are losing part of our lives. We are dying to this life. Jesus today redefines our life with his own cross. Now that we have been redeemed by Jesus' great sacrifice, we bear its mark. The cross inscribed on our heads and on our hearts in baptism has become the very signature of our lives. We ought not be surprised if we suffer for or are asked to sacrifice for our faith. The world is changing, folks, and it's getting more and more where Christians are going to have to sacrifice and stand up for what's right. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now the world thinks that we're absolutely mad. And we ourselves may find this hard to understand, but Jesus makes a promise. And this is his way. He does things his way. Not Satan's way of power and glory, but humbly, servant-like, with a cross, and what looks like losing. He turns the losing into winning, in Easter glory and resurrection joy. Now, I don't know if you guys ever did this, but I'm guessing that most of you had. Some of you, uh, you tomboys and girls that are tom uh, tomboys as well, you maybe did this when you were little. Did you ever go bug hunting? Go bug hunting? We used to do it with the Gerber baby food jars, which were glass in those days. Joni's smiling because you remember this. So, you know. And we poke little holes in the top of the lid so that the bugs could breathe. Well, anyways, uh, if you're going to have a butterfly, you really have to let that butterfly go. You know, the child who grabs a butterfly in his fist and squeezes it too tightly, you know what's going to happen, right? He's going to open his hand, and what he's going to find is not a butterfly, but a rather gooey mess plastered to the palm of his hand. That's what he's going to find, okay? But not a butterfly. But the child who waits patiently, holding a flower in her hand, and just stands there and waits, many, many times, if they stand real still, that butterfly will come and it will land on the flower or maybe even right on their hand and sit there for a few seconds so that they can observe it up close before it flies away. See, that's the only way to have a butterfly. Likewise, life is not kept by grasping it with a clenched fist, but it's received as a gift from God, beautiful and whole and totally up to Him. Jesus has given us this life, redeemed in His cross. On that last day, He will restore it even more beautifully to us. And it's not our grasping, but His giving to us that gives us life and keeps us alive. Oddly, it is in the losing, not the grabbing, the true life, real life, is from is found from our gospel lesson as well. So when we are asked what we do for a living, how do we answer? How do we answer? Well, you know, you might just try this. Just answer, I am a Christian. My living is dying for Jesus. My gain is giving. And my victory is losing. Now, I'm sure that if you were to say that, at an office Christmas party this coming December, you might find someone, or maybe several someones, that will be sidling away from you after you have said it, trying to get his way as fast as they possibly can, right? Now, we might never say it at a party, but it's true. As Christians, we lose for a living. God defines our very lives today. He bought them with a significant price. It is His right. But this is also a very good thing, for God defines our lives with His own salvation act. We are not the people of angelic glory, or are we mighty heroes of some pagan mythology? 
Jesus has invited us to take up a cross and follow him. The cross on which the salvation of the world was won. It is not an easy thing to be, but it is the absolute highest and holiest and best thing of all to be a Christian. We are people for whom the Lord of life has laid down his life. We are people of the greatest gift ever given. Defined by his great sacrifice for us, we proclaim his death to everyone we come in contact with. And sometimes, you know what, we even use words to do that. For his cross is emblazoned on us, and it is emblazoned in our heart as well. In Jesus' precious name.